Hello and welcome to the second episode of What Is .com's Virtual Book Club. I'm Wes Chai and with me today are my fellow technical writers, Ben, Caitlin, Alex, and Peggy. So in this episode, we'll be discussing chapters three and four of the Phoenix Project, which is a book about DevOps by Gene Kim, George Spafford, and Kevin Baer. I found these chapters to be especially interesting because the plot exposition really started to pick up and we started to see some major themes and concepts emerge. So in chapter three, Bill, Patty, and Wes continue to try to figure out who or what caused the payroll outage. Um, in chapter four, Sarah Moulton, who is the senior vice president of retail ops, throws the entire IT operations department under the bus and blames them for the Phoenix project not being delivered on time. Since we read a lot of definitions here at whatis.com, I decided to ask everyone to pick a definition to talk about in context with this week's reading. So let's start with you, Peggy. Um, what definition did you pick to exemplify this week's reading? I picked cognitive bias. And the reason I picked it is because um, it's an error in logic that's caused by the tendency for people to um, perceive information through a filter bubble of their own experience. And I did that when I was reading these chapters. So what happened is that Bill is conducting forensics to fill out the root cause of the payroll outage. And um, Brent remembers that he, get a, he got a call from a developer who needed to install security patch before leaving for vacation. And we're told that the developer's name is Max. So I assumed automatically that the developer was a he. And in the book, Brent and Patty do the same thing. So I'm super embarrassed to have jumped to that conclusion because I learned in the sequel, The Unicorn Project, that Max is actually Maxine. So my cognitive bias was gender-based, gender bias. And it reminded me of that old, um, that riddle, the one where the doctor refuses to operate because the patient is their son. Remember that one? I'm not familiar with it. And some bells. <laughs> Maybe you're too young. <laughs> A father and son were in a car accident where the father was killed. The ambulance brought the son to the hospital. He needed immediate surgery. In the operating room, a doctor comes in and looks at the little boy and says, I can't operate on him. He's my son. Who's the doctor? Give up? Yes, I give up. The doctor is his mom. Oh, uh, yeah. again. <laughs> Another reason I picked uh, cognitive bias as my takeaway this week is that I keep running into people who think the Phoenix Project is only about DevOps. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, I'm not sure where that bias is coming from, honestly, because, you know, it's clear we're learning a lot more from, you know, reading this book than just say, you know, like the value of something like continuous integration or continuous delivery. So Alex, what term did you pick? I picked cowboy coding. Um, I picked that as my definition because I felt like it sums up the actions caused uh, by the payroll outage really well. Uh, cowboy coding is when developers bypass an established uh, checks and balances to deploy code, which is exactly what John and the developer did. Uh, when you have an undisciplined approach to software development and developers are forced to edit code on a live production server, uh, like Patty says, it becomes like the Wild West. Um, and you could even call it like a spaghetti Western because when there's no formal process for making changes, you end up with a bunch of spaghetti code, which ultimately increases the likelihood of something else going wrong. Spaghetti Western. <laughs> So actually, Alex, that was a perfect example of the term that I chose, which was, I'm oh, sorry, you can't see it, but it's change management. And, um, you know, good change management makes information readily available and uh, root causes of issues trackable. And that's pretty much the exact, exact opposite of what happened uh, in your example and in general at Parts Unlimited. Uh, Max made the code change without going through the standard procedures. And as a result, Bill, Patty, and Wes had to waste their time being detectives to get the information they needed. Um, when change management is policy driven, change management is policy driven. It allows employees to make changes predictably without causing serious problems. Uh, a long history of bad change management can lead to the kind of disasters we witnessed in chapters three and four. Um, oh yeah, and it was almost funny how 
when Bill got his replacement laptop near the end of the chapter, it was twice as big and um, three times as slow and the battery pack was falling off on the bottom. I think that was also a perfect example of really bad change management. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, things really aren't going so hot for the IT department at Parts Unlimited. Um, so I see where you're, you know, you're getting that. Uh, yeah, it's interesting too, because, you know, you see the press ref, sorry, press release that, uh, you know, the book started off with, and at that point, you know, you think that things can't really get any worse, but then, you know, you know, this week, you know, there's a press release that's, you know, <laughs> definitely tops that. All right, it's your turn now. Um, which definition jumped out to you during these two chapters? I chose employee productivity. Um, mostly because there's a lot of uh, discussion around the constraints that are preventing employees from producing quality work. Um, one thing that jumped out at me during the two chapters was how poor the communication is between teams and how there's like this lack of collaboration between departments, kind of everybody's out for themselves. Um, and it's really hurting overall um, productivity. Um, it was good to see Bill make Wes and Chris's teams have um, IT ops and the development teams meet in person, which nobody had been doing before. Um, and I was a little surprised when he ordered everyone to attend the next change manage management meeting um, or face disciplinary action. It was a pretty hard line. Or face disciplinary action. Wow. So, yeah, I mean, it, I guess, you know, that could be considered another reference to Bill's military background for sure, um, which definitely did come up again in chapters three and four. It's a repeated theme. Yeah, um, I think employee productivity also comes up when Bill has to deal with his own email management issues. Um, it's only his second day on the job and he's inundated with over 600 email messages and 60 voicemails, which would literally take him days to go through. To look up one of our other definitions for uh, inbox zero. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Wes, what did you pick? Right, so I picked corporate theater, which uh, we don't have a definition for, but I think we need one. And you know, despite what it sounds like, it is not uh, you know, just a movie theater in an office building. So, you know, corporate theater is what Bill used to describe what Sarah did to him during the emergency project management meeting when she, you know, blamed the quote unquote, lack of urgency on Bill's team as the cause of the Phoenix Project's failure. Um, and yeah, it was kind of shocking when she threw him under the bus by saying, maybe you're not prioritizing correctly. Maybe you're you know, just not used to supporting a project this important. And then you know, the whole time while she's talking to him, she's actually looking at Steve, who's the CEO, you know, to see how he reacts rather than Bill, who she's addressing. So you know, it's obvious that it's all performative. Um, and yeah, and to me, this was really interesting, just seeing how politics at the top level of a corporation can directly affect downstream deliverables by dictating which points of the value stream get more or less of the time, resources, and attention that are necessary for a good final result. So yeah, chapter four ends with Bill saying, before I was merely worried that IT operations was under attack by development, information security, audit, and the business. And now I'm starting to realize that my primary managers seem to be at war with each other as well. So, you know, it, it doesn't really, you know, give any indication that it will fade, you know, in the near future of this book. All right, so what do you guys think next week's big definition will be? I think it's gonna be soft skills. I'd go with something like Myers-Briggs. I'm gonna bounce off of Caitlin and say team collaboration. I'm going to go corporate governance. All right. Those are all great choices. And that'll be a wrap for today. So make sure you subscribe to Eye on Tech, and we will see you next episode. Can't wait to see what the word is. <laughs>